The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. So our speaker today is Tom Moffat, speaking on battery-operated cars. Tom is a retired information technology manager where he spent lots of time investigating new technologies. Prior to landing in the computer field, he worked in a large variety of industries including oil and gas, mining, and tax assessing for Revenue Canada. We won't hold him against, <laughs> against that. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Please welcome Tom. Thanks for coming out, folks. It's great to see a lot of people here today. And so our uh, topic, as you see, is, is a battery electric vehicle right for you? There's a couple of acronyms on the screen here which uh, we might come across in today's presentation. Uh, a BEV is a battery electric vehicle. A FEV is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. ICE refers to an internal combustion engine. So if you hear an uh, electric car owner complaining someone has iced their car, that means they've parked their gasoline car in the space reserved for electric charging. So we're privileged to be witnessing the birth of a whole new transportation paradigm. Something like this hasn't happened since automobiles took over from the horse and buggy uh, more than a century ago. I missed that one, but I'm excited to be part of the current transformation. So if you're in the market for a new or a new to you vehicle, now the question comes up, is a battery electric vehicle right for you? And we'll be talking about uh, full electric vehicles today, not hybrids. So we'll look at the pluses and minuses of fully electric vehicles. And amid the flood of information and disinformation about this new technology, we'll pick out some of the important things you may need to know. My own interest in electric vehicles came about because of my concern with catastrophic climate change. So I became an early adopter and I've been driving electric vehicles for 14 years. Uh, 10 years with hybrids and the last four in a Ford Mustang Mach-E, which is a fully electric vehicle. Uh, I research a lot of uh, battery electric vehicle technology for my own interest and uh, I enjoy sharing what I've learned. So we're looking, we're going to look at things from um, uh, the perspective of six different questions uh, when it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, does it work? How much does it cost? Will it last? What can or can't it do? Are EVs really green? And what about fuel? Number one, does it work? Electric engines are um, an excellent technology. They're typically very simple with uh, only one moving part and it's an evolving technology as well. They're very easy to maintain and very high revolutions are possible. Um, because electric engines are suddenly so popular, they are coming up with new electric engines designs all the time. Um, they're making them lighter, more powerful. They're making ones that don't need rare earth elements, which would make them cheaper. Uh, so this technology is changing quite a bit at the, at the current time. Batteries. Uh, batteries are also evolving. Uh, right now there's two main types that are used in electric cars. LFP batteries, which is lithium iron, phos iron phosphate and NMC batteries, nickel, manganese, cobalt. The iron battery is cheaper and works better in cold weather. The nickel has more range, better energy density, and uh, works better in hot weather. We all know that solid state batteries are coming along very quickly. 
In fact, you can buy a car in China right now that does have solid state batteries. And this battery technology will be uh, cheaper, have longer range, and be less prone to fires. You'll be able to hammer nails into it without uh, causing any kind of chain reaction. So that's coming, but still, um, these things take a while to come into production. So it'll be a few years yet, but in the 2030s for sure, I expect to see a number of vehicles with solid state batteries. In the meantime, the ones we have do work quite well. Our ranges are fairly decent. Uh, but size counts, bigger is better. For replacements, um, this can be an issue if you needed to replace your battery for some reason. It is an expensive, large piece of the car and it's quite often built in and hard to get at. And there is a danger of fires with uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries uh, because if you penetrate them with a metal object, they can have a runaway thermal reaction and a fire. Transmissions are also very simple. There's usually one gear, zero to infinity, although some cars have added gears just for entertainment. And um, they give you very high torque right off the bat. They give you all the power the car has, typically, right from the beginning. You don't have to go through any gearing to get to it. The most problematic area of cars is software. And this is not really an EV issue, it's a new car issue. It's the kind of thing that they're putting not just in EVs, but in all new cars. And uh, they're doing, adding a lot of new features like full self-driving, uh, lane keeping, automatic cruise. Uh, they're taking the hard buttons off the dashboard and putting them in the computer menus. And um, in my own case, I've had several maintenance issues with the car. Um, most of them have been software related. I've had to take it to the dealer so they can tweak the software. And almost every company is trying to write their own software, which uh, if you know anything about how difficult it is to write working software programs, this is, this is not a great situation. How much does it cost? Yes, EVs do cost more to purchase up front. And one of the main reasons is the battery. It's an extra piece of the car. It is quite expensive. But studies show that a lower cost of ownership compared to an equivalent ICE vehicle can happen in as little as five years. Um, lots of studies have shown uh, time ranges for this kind of equivalency in five to 10 years. Um, so if you're keeping the car uh, for 10 years, you will have a lower total cost of ownership than if you had purchased the equivalent gas vehicle. And as a bonus, you have low maintenance costs. Tire replacement, it can be an issue for some people. It depends a lot on driving style. Consider pairing it with solar to lower electricity costs when you do home charging. Now there are rebates available for purchasing an electric car. Currently in Alberta, there's a $5,000 federal rebate available. This is for uh, personal vehicles like cars and pickup trucks. If you're looking at a larger vehicle, say you're a business that wants a delivery van, there is a $200,000 uh, federal grant available for that. <coughs> so will an electric car last? Battery life and replacement. Some batteries have been studied um, extensively in the last five years and they are, because they are getting better, we have discovered that um, Batteries are going to last uh, 20 years in most cases, the current uh, batteries that you're purchasing. So that means at the end of 20 years, you will still have 80% of the battery available to use to power your electric car. And it's good to know that car makers do warranty their batteries in the associated systems for long periods of time, typically eight to 10 year warranties on the battery itself. 
But if you do have a problem, say you get into an accident, batteries are often difficult to remove and because of the new technologies coming along, you might want to replace a battery just to get a better one. So manufacturers could do much better at this. Um, in fact, there are some manufacturers that do uh, make it very easy to replace a battery. A lot of uh, manufacturers do not. It's built right into the structure of the car and it's very hard to get at. So what can and can't a battery electric vehicle do? Um, let's talk about range. Now many vehicles now offer 300 miles of range as a typical average uh, type of range when you purchase a new EV. So that works out to 480 kilometers. Um, you, the higher range vehicles are often more expensive. You could get up to 500 miles of range, but you're going to pay more money. My own uh, vehicle, the Mustang Mach-E, has a range of 270 miles or 425 kilometers. This is under ideal conditions. Cold weather can lower your range by as much as 30 percent. For this reason, I would recommend that you get a vehicle with a heat pump. In, in my case, the... Uh, Hannah's ready to help you get the video. Okay. In my case, um, <coughs> my vehicle doesn't have a heat pump, um, but many of the new vehicles do. So I've got a short video to show you one of the manufacturers that does a good job at uh, batteries. It's NIO, a Chinese car company. And they take the approach of swapping batteries instead of plugging in your car to charge it. So you just pull into a swap station, takes two or three minutes, you get a new battery, you drive away. Uh, the Neo will back itself in. There's a button in the car you just have to push so you don't have to worry about backing it into the swap station. Typically the batteries are on the bottom uh, like a skateboard and, and most electric vehicles. Okay, towing and cargo. Towing a load will kill your range, so EVs are not a good option for drivers that need to tow heavy items or haul large cargo loads. New solutions are coming, um, such as battery-powered RVs, battery-powered RV trailers, and battery-powered transport truck trailers. Charging speeds. Charging stops are typically 20 minutes to 45 minutes long uh, if you're using a public charger. Of course, um, if you're charging at home, you would often do it in the garage at night or uh, in the driveway at night. Um, and it takes a little longer on a home charger than it does on a public charger, but um, you don't really mind because you're asleep usually. When we travel, we try to combine charging activities such as uh, with other activities such as getting a coffee, having supper, doing some shopping, or sightseeing. But drivers who don't want to take breaks and are committed to getting everywhere as fast as possible are not great candidates for EV ownership. Are EVs really green? Uh, short answer, yes they are. There are a, n a large number of myths out there about why EVs are not green, and uh, we'll talk about a couple of them. 
Uh, one is that dirty grids will invalidate your EV's environmental value. But this is not true. Showing, studies have shown that an EV is still better for the environment even if the charging system you're using is a coal-fired one. But don't forget, you can improve your ecological footprint by adding some solar microgeneration to your home. Is building EVs bad for the environment? EV manufacturing does involve making a significant extra part, and that's the battery. And this means more resources used compared to building an ICE vehicle. However, operating a comparable gas car for a year would negate, uh, or would match the amount of environmental um, distress caused by the ex extra manufacturing burden. Um, there are lots of claims that batteries from EVs can't be recycled. In fact, the opposite is true. There's a high demand for um, batteries from electric vehicles. Uh, Unfortunately, they, they won't be able to meet that demand very well because the batteries are predicted to last the life of the car. But even then, um, they can have other uses. If a battery is too uh, weak to be very useful for charging your electric car anymore, you can still use it in a battery storage system, for example. Uh, and at the end of their lifespan, people do wa want them to take them apart and reuse the materials in them. There is a, a good book on um, addressing EV myths that's available uh, in the link on this page. So what about fuel? This uh, can be one of the biggest learning curves with an electric vehicle, how to charge it. There are um, three different uh, charging types and speeds, level one, level two, and level three. So sample rates for those would be 2.3 kilowatts, 11 kilowatts, and 150 kilowatts in the case of uh, a Mustang Mach-E. Uh, a number of char uh, electric vehicles now will charge it up to 350 kilowatts. So that's the kind of charging you can only do on a DC fast charger, which is um, a large piece of public infrastructure that needs uh, a transformer and a lot of electrical connection to make it work. At home, you can have the level one, which is what you call a normal wall plug, like that one there or a level two, which is what you would call your dryer plug or your stove plug, the 220 volt system you have there. Now cables and charging ports differ. Sometimes you need adapters to make things work. For example, there's the Tesla charging port called a NAX versus non-Tesla charging ports, usually CCS. Uh, so the big question EV owners ask is, can we get some standardization? Because every public charging network is different. They have different speeds, different access methods, different payment methods, and proprietary software. They have to make their software work with 25 different car company software. Um, so software communication failures are common. And there's a big learning curve to figure out how to use all the different charging networks if you're going on a road trip. Home is the best charging location. I typically plug in my car once or twice a week for four to six hours. Uh, many remote locations still have no public charging. And so this is an issue if you're traveling to those remote places on a regular basis. An EV may not be right for you. You can use the PlugShare app to see charger locations. This is a picture from the PlugShare uh, app, which I uh, took in May. And uh, it'd be good to point out a couple of things here. Thank <laughs> you. 
going to Cold Lake, that one is broken and has a wrench. So your trip to Cold Lake today is off. You'll see that the charging is great in southern Alberta and British Columbia. <coughs> Charging's really good in southern Alberta and British Columbia. However, not so good in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. If you work in Thompson, Manitoba, well, there is no charging, so an EV is not for you. <laughs> so one uh, chart uh, of interest that I added here at the end, uh, it's the effect of uh, battery electric vehicles on the power grid in Norway. So you will hear people say, well, if we all change to electric vehicles, it'll destroy the uh, electrical grid. Uh, the whole thing would collapse. Uh, now in Norway, all sales of vehicles are uh, at 97% electric vehicles now. And it takes a while to get these old uh, gas vehicles off the road, but they have reached 25% of vehicles on the road are electric vehicles. And uh, with that large number of vehicles, we can see the effect on their power grid. The red bar here is the total energy generation in the power grid in Norway. And the blue bar is the effect of the EVs on that power grid, how much power they use. So it's not a zero amount, but it's a, a small amount compared to the total grid usage. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of uh, demand for new uh, electricity uh, in home use uh, for vehicles, for heat pumps, for heat pump dryers, and heat pump water heaters, and uh, we are going to have to keep increasing the capacity of our grid over time to meet these demands, but it's not such a huge demand that it's going to, uh, it's, not, it's not so huge that we can't keep up with it. So in summary, does it work? Yes, and it's fun. But did I mention the learning curve? <laughs> Cost. More upfront, less over time. Will it last? Yes. What can and can't it do? It's good for commuting and traveling. Not good if you're into towing or you need to visit remote areas where the infrastructure is not in place yet. Is it green? Yes. And what about fuel? Home fueling is best. Travel needs planning. Thanks. So we have many supporters. As a unique uh, weekly opportunity for people to discuss issues, SACPA is supported by, in, by many in our community. Thank you to the LSCO who have provided this room free of charge. Thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. We thank, you to the, we thank the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. We thank the Lethbridge Herald for, and other media for their coverage and support. And we thank Roger TV for recording our sessions, which, is, which are available on TV, SACPA.ca, uh, archives, and on YouTube. So I see we have questioners here. We ask the questioners to come line up here, keep their questions short and to the point. And uh, we'll have Bev, the first, first question. I thought it was appropriate as Bev Mindel Atherstone that I'd be the first questioner <laughs> since my name means battery, -operated, battery ele electric vehicle. <laughs> um, so we have, we got our Bolt EV, Chevy Bolt, three and a half years ago. We're happy as clams. We also have 24 batteries, um, photovoltaic batteries in our backyard yeah, cells. cells. And, uh, and we, uh, so we charge maybe once or twice a month. We use the uh, Bolt mainly for commuting right around town. But I have to say that in regard to the remote areas, there is one fabulous feature that you can that you can use when you're off in the wilds, when you're uh, staying at a motel or something. You can get a plug that'll go into a regular outlet, 110, 
and it'll still charge your vehicle. So we've got one of these plugs in our car that has, it's an adapter. It'll, t it'll take forever, but um, it will get you to your next stop. Um, one thing that I found that is just wonderful for sort of, um, you know, I, I should have been a car racer, but I'm sort of frustrated. So um, still, when I'm sitting beside uh, a great big, um, a great big gas guzzling truck and they're just revving up their motor and I'm in my tiny little Chevy Bolt and they're ready to race down the pathways to get up to 50 kilometers an hour and I turn on my little Bolt and it, you know as, as um, Tom said you can go in no time from zero to a thousand so uh, I get go in no time from zero to 50 and I leave that gas guzzling truck in the dust. <laughs> so that's very, very fun. Um, my question is, um, why do you think we don't have solar panels on electric vehicles? Thanks for that, Beb. Uh, that is a good question. And, um, the answer is uh, people have tried and there are some vehicles out there that do have solar panels on them. Um, I guess the main reason is it's not enough bang for the buck. Uh, you can put the solar panels on and get some power from it, it's true. Um, but you're looking at added cost to do that and the amount of power you get is um, not as significant as uh, you might want to uh, enjoy with after you paid that extra money for the solar panels. Um, as the costs of solar come down, we are seeing more people think about uh, adding solar to the roof of EVs and uh, so I think that's something that will that will come. Um, with regards to the uh, plugging into the normal wall outlet, um, typically it would take me two days to fully charge my car uh, on a normal wall outlet. It takes overnight to charge it at level two. And uh, as we mentioned before, at a DC fast charger, it'd probably take anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on which kind of fast charger I was using. Hi, Tom. Henning Mundell here. And uh, of course, we have the same bolt. It's Bev's car. Um, but Tom mentioned that uh, quite a number of the BEV, the uh, battery electric vehicles, have sort of an additional gear. Well, me, we mainly drive with what's called L, which is very different from the L low in ice because it's the one where you get maximum regeneration. So as you uh, actually town driving is ideal for that in contract to your ice car with idling because every time you slow down to a stop sign you regenerate and so many times we live in Sunset Acres many times we come into town and we come back home hey our range is now five kilometers more than it was when we left home so but my question is for example in our car I'm not sure about your uh, Mustang we have that D What's the purpose of the D uh, gear? Why why have the D? Yeah, but, no, this is an ice car though. This is not an ice car, it's a battery electric. Yes, I'm not 100% um, familiar with the, the way the Bolt is set up, but um, a lot of um, electric vehicles have similar systems. So mine has different driving modes. Um, there's an economy mode, uh, which will give you the uh, most um, savings uh, driving around town, and it's probably all you need. And then a normal mode and a sport mode, in the, in the case of my vehicle. Um, and on mine, you can uh, adjust the regeneration. And a lot of electric vehicles actually have paddles on the steering wheel that will allow you to set the regeneration amount. So I typically drive mine with maximum regeneration, which is uh, called one pedal driving. So as soon as I take my foot off the accelerator, it will come to a stop by itself. I don't have to touch the brake. 
So really my brakes should last forever because I hardly ever use them, only in a, an emergency stop kind of situation. And what we're using to slow down the vehicle is the engine. And um, <coughs> it, it works very well. I actually quite enjoy the one pedal um, simplifying things so you don't have to use two different pedals to, to control it. And it's, I find it easy to get used to the uh, rate of regeneration so you can predict how soon it will stop. Um, uh, but like I say, in some cars, it's actually adjustable with those paddles so you can experiment with different rates. Uh, Maria Fitzpatrick, uh, thanks very much, Tom, for your presentation. I, I learned quite a bit. Um, so for me, the issue was always about if you have an electric car, the disposable or the disposal of the battery was my concern in terms of the environment. However, I have heard, as you mentioned, that uh, once the battery is no good in the car, uh, there's still enough uh, space in it, enough power in it, that you can actually store uh, more power in it. So if you have solar panels, you could set up the old battery. Uh, what kind of storage uh, would be available if you're using that battery as storage? And how easy is that to make it happen? Uh, thanks, Maria. A great question. Um, right now, because um, uh, large-scale utility battery storage is uh, booming, this is the most common use for uh, batteries from taken out of electric cars. Uh, and so they will put them in racks in trailers and hook them all together and use them as a uh, way of making solar power and wind power um, more long-lasting so that it's available when the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining. Uh, this is the most typical use right now. I have seen um, some people are using them for home batteries, uh, but this is not um, that common yet. Uh, and so around here it would be hard to access um, that kind of, uh, the, the knowledge and technology to set it up and use it in your own home. Uh, Redwood Materials is a company set up by one of the founders of Tesla who saw the potential in recycling batteries and reusing batteries and uh, it's been quite a successful company since he set it up um, and there really is a lot of competition for um, the batteries out of the electric cars. And matter of fact, Volkswagen um, changed their lease terms saying that you can't have the car at the end of the lease. They want it back because they want the battery. <laughs> My name is uh, Jim Moyer. Thanks for your presentation. I'm driving a small plug-in hybrid, compact. I was hacking around on the internet and I found a graph that showed targets, I must have been American, for 2030 and 2040. My plug-in hybrid are just a hair above 2040. Most of the current EVs, bigger ones, were way above that. The bolt, like Henning drives, was just a hair below it. But my question is, aren't too many of the EVs that are now available are too big, too heavy, too square to meet the targets in the future? Thanks for that. Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, smaller, more aerodynamic EVs are much better for the environment than giant square, super heavy EVs like the Hummer. And so, yes, you can be in an not very environmentally friendly even when you're building an EV. Um, we need to promote smaller, more affordable cars. Uh, the, the trend towards building big, humongous, supersized vehicles is, uh, is one that's better for the car industry because they can make more money when they sell a vehicle, but it's not better for the environment.
Okay, Ken Sears. Um, thanks for the talk, Tom. Um, my question is it's related to something, a related social thing that's happening, which is the right to repair. You twice referenced the fact that the battery and the engine both in a lot of these vehicles are more or less permanently installed and it's going to take specialized technology, usually proprietary technology, to replace and repair that stuff. Is there anybody you know of that's beginning to look at creating vehicles that allow the owner to take out the battery? You can do it with a damn transistor radio. Why can't you do it with a car? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, right to repair is uh, a problem with vehicles. Uh, as we know, a lot of vehicles are uh, getting so much electronics and so uh, many small computers in them that um, it really is a difficult thing to repair a vehicle yourself. Um, and we, we should be uh, pushing more for a right to repair when it comes to and uh, new vehicles. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I have uh, one comment and two questions. My name's Ian Hurdle. I feel a little bit like Henry Ford right now because his wife's favorite vehicle was a Detroit electric vehicle. That's my wife's attitude right now since I'm still doing a gas hog. My questions are for our batteries that are in our cars and we plug them in the garage, are we going to be able to connect to the system so that we're the backup for our grid? I think that's coming. Second is, is there going to be a time of day electricity from our system so that people that are charging at night can get the low rate to charge their vehicles? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ian. Great questions, yeah. Uh, on the time of day, um, there is talk of uh, implementing that in Alberta, but so far uh, nothing concrete has, has happened. Uh, but uh, studies have shown that this is a, a good way to uh, spread out your electrical use and encourage people to do their charging in the off hours. Uh, right now, I would charge uh, when the sun is shining, because I would be making uh, my power from my solar panels, and I wouldn't do it at night, which is the off-peak. But if there was an incentive to do it at night, then I might consider that. Uh, your first question? Is the vehicle's batteries being uh, back up for our grid? Yes. And so there are uh, virtual power grids uh, being uh, designed and used in various places, such as California. and. Uh, the vehicle battery being such a large um, source of electrical power w is ideal for this. And so uh, you can incentivize people to become part of these systems by offering, uh, offering them a cheaper electricity rate in exchange for uh, allowing the grid to use their battery drain uh, their battery and then have it recharge. It can all happen at night, for example, while you're asleep. If your battery is already at 80%, they could drain it down to 60, then it could recharge to 80, and all that could happen um, while you're still in bed. So it's, uh, it's a very forward-looking system, and uh, one of the problems with that is you need to have a robust grid uh, to everybody's residence, so not all of the cabling and transmission that we have in place is uh, able to um, service that kind of system yet. Thanks, Tom. My name is Jason Schreiner. Um, my question was related to batteries being a store of energy for uh, for the public grid. Um, Tom and I are back alley neighbors. Tom, you forgot to uh, say one part in your presentation, just how cool your car looks. <laughs> I get to see it park every day, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, in, in um, Wired Magazine is, um, is a technology magazine that writes popular articles on the latest state of technology. Once a year they, they publish a Blue Sky article where experts in various fields predict the future of the area of their 
their expertise in this year's uh, EV article. They anticipated a world where every fixed structure like a home or an office building was a power generating, um, uh, was a producer as well as a user, and then cars, uh, electric vehicles would be part of that, uh, that public storage of, of, a, of, of energy so that the draw would be, uh, would be coming uh, when necessary. If you're not using it, it's going to be, uh, be available for your neighbor who needs to dry their hair uh, while you're at work um, and, and vice versa. That uh, it become ideally in a future world um, uh, a publicly accessible uh, storage of energy. So, yeah, thanks for touching base on that. Yeah. Yeah, and just uh, we have to emphasize again that this involves a lot of grid redesign. So you need a willingness uh, uh, from people to realize that the grid needs updates and changes, and it also needs to expand as demands increase. And um, we need to start working on that now. I haven't really seen signs of that here in Alberta. Um, it's a lot of well, we don't think anything needs to change. So um, it's, uh, it's easy enough to meet demand if you're looking at it to gradually over time, but if you let things slide for too long, then you're, you're really going to be in a hole, and at some point you're going to decide you need major upgrades. Uh, good afternoon, Tom. Uh, my name is Stan Knowlton. And um, my question has to do with uh, infrastructure. I'm always amazed at um, looking at some of these old pictures of the city of Lethbridge and seeing these streetcars running around sort of tethered to these uh, overhead power lines. And now you can look around and you can see uh, these electric buses driving around with the batteries on them. And I've always wondered why there was never uh, infrastructure that was designed where that electric bus uh, could also be tethered to uh, some overline or even, you know, in the ground type of power lines that could be recharged, you know, as they're moving from one place to the other. Or, uh, like myself, I'm always in the, um, you know, the slow lane going between Lethbridge and Fort McLeod. It takes about 30 minutes. And if there was, instead of a slow lane, that you'd have a charging lane uh, that would be able to you'd pull in there, and by the time you reach your next point, um, you know, your battery's fully charged, to be able to take you uh, down the road a little farther. So I couldn't find anything, you know, that uh, anybody was doing that yet, and I was just wondering if there is anything in the works for something like that. Thank you, Stan. Yes, a good question. Um, and yes, there are some uh, pilot projects in place that do in the road charging. The uh, last one I read about was in Florida. And um, so this is tec technically possible uh, that you can put uh, wireless charging in the road surface and people can be charging their vehicles as they drive. Also, there's some uh, wireless charging being designed for garages, so you don't actually have to plug in your car, you just drive into the garage and it starts charging because it's over the charging pad. Uh, whether it will become common or not, I guess, depends on economics. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Patricia Buswell, and I need some clarification. Maybe I misheard what you were saying. I drive a little Honda Fit right now, gas run, fill it up every six weeks. It's, it's a very efficient car, so I'm not looking at changing anyway. But what scared me was I thought I heard you say when you had the map of all the stations where you can charge, that you couldn't just drive up to any electric station and fill up, because some of them were being controlled by one company and others by another. And I thought, how in the dickens would I know whether or not that one was going to be available to me? 
Am I right that you actually said that you can't fill up in every single one? Yeah, you can, but it's not easy. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, question. Yes, you can fill up at all the ones that are marked available on the uh, map, but it's not easy. This is where that learning curve comes in. Unfortunately, um, I have 20-some uh, different apps on my phone uh, to access different charging networks. And I had to learn how to use them all. I had to set up memberships for them. I had to, in some cases, uh, pre-deposit money into those apps so that I could um, pay via the app. Um, and so they haven't made it uh, so that the machines are simple enough that I can just walk up and hit it with my debit card, which is um, a pain to be honest. <laughs> now, uh, the United States is progressing on this because Biden has made it a requirement. Uh, if you want to get the money to build new electric charging stations from their uh, new uh, economic plan in the United States, you have to make your charging station compatible with just using a credit card or a debit card. And because the United States is going to be adopting this, uh, then the, and that's where most of the charging companies that build these uh, machines are located, then it's going to spread to Canada. But right now, um, the charging experience is one of the worst parts of owning an EV. I'll stick to my Honda Fit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom, for coming to speak about my favorite vehicles. Uh, I have a plug-in hybrid, and I love it. Uh, but my question relates to, uh, there seems to be a lot of talk about fires, battery fires, and home insurance going up if you have a charging station in your garage, and those kind of issues. Um, which I think are probably all blown a bit, but you know, there's fires from, from gasoline too, and diesel, so I don't know whether fires from batteries are worse, but could you uh, talk a little bit about insurance rates and those kind of issues? Thanks, Knut. Um, yeah, insurance uh, can be an issue, and um, what we're seeing is that some of the insurance companies are unsure how to handle uh, electric vehicles, and uh, that results in them coming up with higher rates to insure an electric vehicle, uh, to insure your home if that's where you're parking an electric vehicle. Um, also, uh, if you have solar panels, to insure solar panels. Um, so uh, this is probably something that will be not as much of a problem over time, but because things are relatively new and unknown, um, and they're not sure in a lot of cases about, oh, what's the repair cost of an electric vehicle, if, it, um, if we have to replace it um, or fix it. and. Um, you're right. The fire issue is uh, overblown. The number of fires due to uh, battery issues is quite small compared to the number of fires in gas cars. Uh, however, um, if you have a lithium battery, it's the fire is harder to put out. So uh, fire departments do need to be aware of uh, how to put out fires with uh, lithium car batteries. So if they are uh, the most common source of uh, fires is um, accidents of some kind. Uh, there have been instances of uh, poor battery design, but those, uh, if that's discovered, then it does get repaired under these large battery warranties that we're talking about. For example, the Bolt did have a problem with battery design in the first few years and uh, the company proactively replaced the batteries in all the bolts. Um, 
although it did take some, some time for them to get around to doing that. In the meantime, they put out a software fix which throttled the power usage of the bolt uh, so that it wouldn't be in danger of this design flaw. So I'll put in my two cents worth. I have a Honda Clarity plug-in hybrid. And one of the unique things about this uh, one is that it controls the temperature of the battery. Apparently, uh, extreme temperatures are very detrimental to the longevity of a battery. And they found that out in the southern US. The batteries don't last as long because it's hot and the batteries overheat. So in the Clarity, the plug-in Clarity, if it's a cold day and I have it plugged in, it'll preheat the battery before I go so the longevity of the battery is better. But when it's hot, it also cools. It uses the AC system to also cool the battery. So if I'm driving on a hot day and I park my car in front of my house, it doesn't turn off. It's still going. And I thought, what's going on? And it's actually the AC is still going to cool that battery down so it doesn't get that hot. So I'm just wondering, is that technology being uh, adopted? Or, and do you know if your vehicle has a heating, cooling system to keep your battery at a certain temperature? So one of the um, problems with the first year of the Mustang mach -E is it didn't have these systems. But as you mentioned, people are adding these systems now to the newest electric vehicles. Um, and it all has to do with uh, battery longevity. If you want to keep your battery um, at a high operating level for a long time, then one of the things you have to do is control the temperature, uh, especially when you're charging. Um, if you charge for long periods of time, the battery can heat up, so you want to have a system to keep it cool, it'll uh, charge faster, and uh, also in the winter you want to keep it warm because uh, charging can be very slow if it's minus 30 at a public charger unless you've preheated the battery, so they're all designing systems uh, that will preheat the battery before you get to the charger, so it's at the ideal temperature for, for charging. Uh, and that's the thing to look for. In, uh, if you're purchasing a new vehicle, you want to have these systems, um, so it'll make your battery last longer, and it will keep your uh, things like your winter range high. Instead of losing 30% in the winter, you, won't, you might lose 10%. Well, thank you very much. Would you have a take home? Oh, do you have one more, oh, one more question? We'll have, okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Tom. My, my name is uh, Timothy Pope. Um, I drive a, uh, a Tesla Model 3. And um, on the, to the topic of temperature, um, when, you, when you hear people talk about, uh, critically, uh, of, uh, of EVs, um, they often seem to be raising problems that they think nobody has ever thought about. And so I think the one thing that you can realize when you, when you go in for an EV is that most of the problems have been thought about and they've been solved. Uh, however, there is, uh, you talked about the learning curve, and I'm finding that um, in the winter especially, there's definitely a learning curve. Uh, if, uh, if you set out from Lethbridge, as we did uh, three Christmases ago, to drive to the airport in Calgary, it was something like 10 degrees above when we left, and it was 10 degrees below when we got to Calgary. And so we were walking, we were driving into this uh, <coughs> north wind, and we were a little bit late and so I didn't have time to charge the car before I dropped it off at the uncovered out-of-door parking in Calgary. And so there was something like 20 kilometers of range left. And the car was going to sit there for three weeks while we were in England. And um, I was worried. <laughs> um, because I knew that even if you're not driving a car, a battery will gradually deplete, especially in cold weather. So um, anyway, we got on the plane. And uh, about a week before we came back, I started to get messages from the car, emails mm. and texts. It, it, can, it, it, it communicates with you either way, you know. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the emails were saying um, uh, the uh, state of charge is 
dangerously low, and you may not be able to drive to a charging point um, when you come back to the car. So return to the car quickly, <laughs> you know, as if I was walking around the mall in Calgary. Well, I was in England, so I, I couldn't do that. All I could do was pray for the car, and I did, in fact, um, uh, email uh, a Tesla um, uh, uh, hotline to, to find out whether my battery was going to be destroyed or damaged or whatever if I, you know, if I couldn't get it charged again. Um, and uh, the person actually wasn't very helpful. He, he just didn't want to be quoted on anything, uh, you know, in case I was going to say, well, Tesla said this and, you know, it didn't work out as well as that. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, when I came back, um, the, it was still ten, to, ten below. The Tesla was covered in ice, and um, uh, every day up to that point, I had been getting reminders. You know, you must charge me. You must charge me. I, I'm in danger of uh, of dying. Um, so uh, the first test is when you get to the car. Um, if you can open the door, then there is power in the car. So. I tried the door handle and it opened. So that meant there was a little bit of electricity there. There was, technically there was none left. I mean, the car was reporting zero, zero kilometers is range. So um, anyway, I got in. I obviously didn't want to turn on the heating, even though it's freezing cold. So I chipped away at the ice around the windshield and then thought, I wonder if I can back out. So I backed out, and yes, it worked. And I had four kilometers from uh, Skyview parking to the chargers in, in uh, North Calgary. And so I went along at 20 kilometers an hour, trying not to overpower the car. And it got me there. And I reached the uh, charging stations, and there were eight stations there. There was one free. And I backed into it, and it worked. <laughs> I mean, it, it might it, you know, the charging point might not have worked, but, but it did. And so the, mo the moral uh, of all this was um, that electric vehicles um, uh, are built conservat uh, conservatively. And so if um, there, there is a wider margin for error than you might think. Uh, and so um, my, my experience over the four years that I've had this Tesla uh, is that it will come through for you <laughs> in the end. Um, although I wouldn't want to repeat the test that I <laughs> gave at that time. H have you heard anything like that? <laughs> yes, excellent. It's a story. And um, quite often there is a bit of a buffer in the system. Uh, I know that Ford, for example, reserves 10% of the battery for themselves, and uh, so you're really not at 0% um, or 100% when, when it says you are. There is still a little bit there that you might be able to access. <coughs> yeah, I may add that AMA now has a charging system. If you can call them up, just like if your 12-volt uh, battery's dead, they boost. They also can boost your electric vehicle now. I don't know if the service is available in Lethbridge, but it certainly is in Calgary and Edmonton. So anyway, do you have a take-home message for us before we end? Oh, well, sure. Um, and that message is um, people will adopt a better technology when it comes along. So uh, we can refer to the famous quote by a Shell department head that said, uh, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. Uh, it is a good technology and um, I, I think a lot of the people that make the leap are very happy with it and uh, it is going to spread. You just have to look at the huge investments in gigafactories and uh, billion dollar investments made by all the major car companies to know that there's, uh, there's really no turning back. It is coming. Uh, to be the dominant method of uh, personal transportation. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of how long, how long will that transition take? Well, thank you very much, Tom.
So next week's speaker will be uh, Jill Young, and she'll be speaking on the con uh, about the continued need for the YWCA. Thank you.